Hi everyone, my name is Joseph and welcome to the American Civil War Museum's Homefront Education Series where we bring the stories of the Civil War and of our collection straight to you at home. But today we're going to be looking through uh, one of our classroom programs, Artifact Investigation. Well, we have to start out first understanding what is an artifact. Well, simply spoken, or simply put, an artifact is anything. It's anything of value to a person that might have been left behind that tells us a little bit more about that person. Something as simple as a shoe, a jacket, a ring, or a book can be an artifact in the right hands. And so we're going to be looking at some of the artifacts that we've got here in each of our boxes so we can tell a little bit more about the person who might have worn them. Now, these are all reproduction artifacts, of course, but they are from a person that was real, or meant to represent a person who was real and lived through the Civil War. So as we go through each of them, we want to keep three questions in mind. One, does this say man or woman? A rather simple question that tells us a very basic item about that person's life. Two, since we are about talking about the Civil War era, we want to know whether they sided with the Confederacy, the United States, or if they simply chose neither. Then last, we definitely want to find out as much as we can about each of these people through any of the remaining artifacts that might have been there. So, with those things in mind, let's get started. Our first box we're going to open up here contains a couple of different items. Uh, right here we can see, ah, this appears to be a skirt that was worn very easily enough. It's a little bit of a lesser material than you might find on some of the fancier skirts of that time, but there is also a matching top for this piece as well. And that tells us that this is more than likely a woman who's wearing these items. Now that's not entirely the case for everyone, uh, there's a specifically a woman named Mary Edwards Walker who wore whatever she wanted and actually caused quite a stir by wearing men's trousers. But in this particular case, I think it would be reasonable enough to assume that this is more than likely a woman. Uh, we also have a lantern here, which, while concealed on primarily on three sides, does have a nice open front so the light can be directed in a very specific way good for getting around at night without casting light in every direction. And we also have some study guides. It appears to be the alphabet. E is for the eagle, soaring high, an emblem of the free. But while we can chain our brother man, our type he cannot be. Hmm. A is an abolitionist, a man who wants to free the wretched slave and give to all an equal liberty. B is a brother with a skin of somewhat darker hue, but in our Heavenly Father's sight, he's as dear as you. That's interesting. Along with this chalkboard, this can easily tell us that this person is either learning or is themselves a teacher. And given the content of what they're teaching or learning, it's more than likely that this person was formerly enslaved. So let's take a look. Ah, a good one. This is meant to represent Miss Susie King Taylor. Now, Mrs. Taylor was, in fact, born as an enslaved woman in Georgia. She was only 12 years old when the war started, and she couldn't read or write, at least not to begin with. In fact, in Georgia and in several other states, it was illegal to teach African Americans to read or write. And so, Mrs. Or Mrs. Susie, in fact, does learn through a secret group of schools that are organized by African American women. Now, if they're caught, they could get into a lot of trouble, but Susie does eventually learn to read and write. And by the time that she manages to seize her own freedom and make her way to the United States Army during the war, 
she is put in charge of a school for teaching other formerly enslaved African Americans to read and write themselves. She furthermore goes on to become a nurse and follows the camp in various places as they're going from area to area and encountering all the battles that these, the, in particular, First Carolina, First South Carolina Regiment uh, does. Now, she's also the only African American woman that we know of who wrote about her experiences during the times in which she was at camp. And her book is actually how we know a lot about how these camps were organized. So it's good to have Susan King Taylor represented on our table. But let's move to our next one. Right here and up front we have a box that is filled with, well, to begin with, a nice vest, double-breasted, uh, not too similar to mine, although uh, it does have a nice little pocket up in the front here on both sides. Kind of wish I had that on mine, actually. But generally speaking, these are the vests that men would wear during the Civil War, during that time period. So I think it's reasonably, it's, it's reasonable enough to assume that this is worn by a man. Oh, we also have some iron tools. This one here, as well as a couple of other ones right in there. And ah, to further help us with that, the country gentleman. Now, this is more than less going to prove to us that this is a man that's going there. The actual brush itself, as well as the shaving soap, uh, definitely helps us conclude that this is a gentleman who was uh, very well aware of his appearance as well. And this is an interesting one. It's a letter in a language I cannot read. I'm not even going to attempt to actually try to sound any of these out. Uh, I will butcher the language and uh, that would not be good for anyone, but it does appear that it's written to, uh, yeah, it's written to his mother. And if I know my languages well enough, and going all the way back to middle school Italian class, I'd be reasonably certain to say that this is Italian. And with that, the iron tools, the vest, and the Italian list here, or Italian letter, I think that this is probably a Mr. George Perini. So. That it is. Now, George Perini is an interesting person as well. Now, what's interesting about George is that while we do work, we know that Susie King Taylor, she does actually work for the United States Army as a nurse as well as as a teacher, George Perini works here at the Tredegar Iron Works in Richmond, Virginia, where our museum has been built. And George Perini was working for the Confederacy, as the Tredegar Ironworks itself actually did uh, produce nearly half the cannon for the entirety of the Confederacy over the course of the Civil War. But George started well before the war. He was an immigrant from Italy, and he had started working at the Tredegar Ironworks by at least 1850, and he would continue to do so through the war and even in the years that followed. The Treader Ironworks, why, one of the reasons we set up our museum here on this spot is because of its rich history that dates to 1837 and all the way to 1957. Over 120 years, the Ironworks stood and continued to produce different material, railway cars, spikes, as well as cannon, of course, and shells for the wars that would follow the Civil War. And George Perini, was actually here for a lot of it. He, this picture is of him in 1907, where he was still continuing to work at the ironworks. For over 50 years, George Perini was right here working. And so that's an interesting way of looking at that as well. And as we move to our final box, 
I think we'll have a chance of seeing some else. Well, right off the bat, we do have a blue wool coat, which I think pretty quickly answers on whose side that person might have fallen. Now, this is more than likely the coat of a man, although, again, there were at least well, there are more than 300 women that were fighting in the Civil War as well, and some of them fought for the United States and others fought for the Confederacy. But I'd say it's reasonable to assume that this is a man in this particular instance. We also have a blue kepi. Again, so this is probably a soldier in the army, not just someone who is enlisted or uh, serving as a nurse. We have several other materials here. A book of prayers suitable for the times in which we live. Now, that's an interesting one as well. But it does tell us a little bit more about this person. And a pen. So we know that this person can read and write as well. So there are a lot of interesting pieces in here that tell us about this person. Ah, including a letter from a general dated to, or on April 3rd, to allow this man into the capital. So this is a person who is pretty important, it seems. Well, if I had to venture a guess, I would say this is probably meant to represent Garland White. Now, I wonder if we have anything for Garland White under here. And we don't. That's okay. Because we don't have any pictures of Garland White. But not everyone gets those kinds of pictures. And it doesn't make his story any less significant. Because Garland White's story is one of a lot of tragedy, but also some very important moments. Garland White was born into slavery right around Richmond, Virginia, where we are today. He is sold away from his mother at the, around the age of 10, sold all the way down south to a man in Georgia. And he does eventually manage to seize his own freedom while the person who owned him brought him to Washington, DC. He manages to escape, having learned how to read and write and becoming a preacher. He escapes all the way to Canada and lives an interesting life up there, a happy life. And then the Civil War breaks out, and Garland White has a choice to make. By 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation has fully taken effect, and African American men are able to enlist in the United States Army. Now, the war having turned to one to end slavery, the choice for Garland is whether or not he stays in the safety of Canada or joins this fight to end slavery once and for all. And Garland does choose to join the United States Army and, in fact, recruits many people to join alongside him. And with that kind of dedication, he does gather up people, he serves in the Army, and he is back in Richmond in April of 1865 when the Confederate government has left the city, they are, Garland Dwight and his regiment are entering in, and at that moment in time, there are people who were coming up to him saying, Sergeant White, Garland White, we do have someone who's asking about you. And when he actually approaches the person who is in question, it turns out that this is Garland's mother who he hasn't seen in 20 years, finally reunited right here in the city of Richmond on eight, in April of 1865. And the stories like Garland White's are many. There are many of those such stories of reunion throughout the Civil War. And so now we get to see and explore a lot of those stories through these artifacts that we have today. So what kind of stories are you going to leave behind? Think about it. What's in your pockets? Maybe that's something that future historians will pick through later on. But for right now, we'll just think a little bit about the stories we have laid out.
We'll see you next time.